and welcome to Your Vote Counts. I am Mary Holdman from the League of Women Voters, bringing you this public nonpartisan voter service program. These 2020 general election interviews are made possible through Capital Community Media via remote technology and in collaboration with the Leagues of Women Voters of Oregon and Marion and Polk counties. For this race, all candidates were invited. Candidates did not receive the questions developed by League of Women Voters, AAUW, Salem City Club, and neighborhood associations ahead of time. The candidates were asked to prepare a three-minute statement telling about themselves, their qualifications, and their vision for the office if elected. I would now like to ask candidate Paul Evans, who is running for Oregon House District 20, to share his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I am Paul Evans, and I'm running for the Oregon uh, House of Representatives. I've been serving in that capacity since 2015. Uh, I'm running for what I believe would be the fourth term, and I'd like to put forward that uh, the last six years certainly have been uh, among the most amazing of my life. I'm grateful for the opportunity to have served the last three terms. As I look forward to the upcoming election, I think that there are three factors that really differentiate the candidates and three factors I ask people to look uh, and compare. Those three factors are service, leadership, and results. Over the past 30 years, I have uh, served my community, my state, my nation in many capacities. As a volunteer firefighter, uh, then later as a military officer for about 20 years with service overseas in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other places. I have also served as a local government person, a city councilor, a school board member, and as a mayor. And then I had the opportunity to serve Governor Kungaski as a senior policy advisor on emergency preparedness and veterans issues. Over these last six years, I've done my level best to put that experience to work. And I believe at the end of the day, it has actually made a difference. The difference between those who know how to lead and those who don't really can be measured in results. Not just results that are uh, tangible in terms of what legislation gets passed, and I hope to talk about that in a minute, but leadership is a lifelong pursuit. It is something that I have worked uh, very hard to try and learn, and I'm still a student of, but leadership comes from experience. It comes from leading troops into hostile environments. It comes from leading a classroom. It comes from leading folks from behind in terms of working relationships and, and partnerships throughout your community to make sure that your cities and county work in common cause. I think leadership is one of those things that is so important we forget to look for it. As the chair of the House Veterans and Emergency Preparedness Committee, for the past four years, past two sessions. I routinely have unanimous votes coming out of a committee that is for Republicans and for Democrats because ultimately we put the mission of our state first. And that's what leadership is about. Over these last six years, I'm grateful for the results we've been able to produce. We passed ballot measure 96. I was a lead uh, co-champion co on that. That has unleashed at least a billion additional dollars of federal resources into the state and we've put together veterans programs in every county of the state, every community, every corner, every neighborhood. We've also increased access to education, both K-12 as well as post-secondary. We've expanded healthcare, and we've done our level best to make sure that the workplace is safer and more secure. We have more work to do, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to have served, and I ask people this election to compare the candidates. And if you can, I certainly appreciate uh, the opportunity to continue serving you as your representative. Thank you. Thank you. The first question, what can be put into place to create an infrastructure more resilient to fires, floods, seismic health, and political disasters? I'm grateful for this question. As the chair of the committee responsible for policy in the House on this very subject, We've spent the last three years working on a concept, a legislative concept and a bill that actually we produced in 2019 and again in 2020. The first step is a reform of our existing emergency management complex. For too long, we have tried to make do with 
baling wire and duct tape. We have a system that has effectively become calcified because we have not put enough pressure on strategic investments in both structure, how it operates, as well as the systems, the capacity, more firefighters, more uh, police, uh, more facilities, hardened facilities, equipment, regionally distributed caches of equipment. We have a work group that continues to work on this. We were close last session. Unfortunately, leadership in the Senate and in the governor's office had other priorities. My hope is that moving forward, we will actually be able to achieve these objectives. I ask everybody who's interested in specifics to please look at the House Vets and Emergency Preparedness uh, uh, over the last several years. Those bills are coming back. And for those interested, this coming Friday at, at 10 o'clock, my committee is meeting and we're gonna be listing the priorities moving into the 21-23 session. There's about nine bills specifically aimed at strengthening infrastructure, building capacity, ensuring we have a system of governance that makes sense and is locally driven and actually meets the challenges for the 21st century. What plans would you put in place to address homelessness due to COVID, eviction, and homes lost to the fires? <clears throat> uh, what, what plan I would put in place is uh, really continuation on the work that's being uh, done in addition to uh, more focus on emergency housing. So uh, the things that we have worked on over the past several years, we've put more money into public-private partnerships to leverage construction of more affordable, available housing. We push forward a navigation center for the city of Salem uh, that would basically help triage what homeless folks need and what we can do to get them into the services they deserve. Unfortunately, that actually was not able to move forward because of the Republican walkout. We have put forward veterans housing programs with the idea that if we can get veterans in stable housing, it actually frees up more of the, the other money for folks who aren't veterans. My strategy for ensuring emergency housing has to do with something called the Open Spaces Bill, which we've been pushing over the last several years, that would actually look at fairgrounds and other major public facilities and plan for uh, upgrades in terms of facilities for water, sewer, electrical, et cetera, and mobile housing. So that basically during times of significant stress on the system, we can at least keep people housed and safe and fed. I believe it is a complex problem that is not going to be solved with any one particular bill, but it's something that we have to recognize is a priority for our state. We have a number of people that just do not have security in their housing, and it's hard to build a life if you don't have that basic foundation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So passing a balanced budget, considering the recent events will be a huge task. And I was wondering what would be your guiding principles as you make budgetary choices? So I think when you have to make cuts in budgets, which no one ever wants to do that, there are three components that are important. The first is to recognize what you're trying to achieve. That sounds simple, but sometimes it gets complicated when politics becomes involved. Are we trying to permanently downscale or are we trying to work on programs and try to keep them alive enough so when the economy improves, we can resume and perhaps build? So understanding what the mission is is number one. Number two is recognizing that our priorities must reflect our values. And what that means is perhaps instead of cutting a program, there might be uh, other options. Uh, here's what I mean by that. Creativity and innovation are sometimes talked about in government, but it generally doesn't happen because government is designed to work very slow. I've put forward a proposal that would, instead of looking at the next biennium as pure cuts, would actually leverage other state resources to provide up to $2 billion of funds for construction of infrastructure repair. I've asked the Legislative Council to put together a bill that would look at a legal device, a legal process by which we could take a 10-year loan, notice I didn't say sweep, but a 10-year loan from SAFE and actually pay it back over time by front-loading an additional $2 billion in construction, or at least half of that in construction. We can keep the tax revenues continuing even as we likely expect a secondary downward draft of this economy due to the COVID environment. The, the third thing I want to recommend is that 
in addition to keeping focus on the mission and being creative, we also have to remember that we are the public's servants. And what that means is, I believe that legislators need to be communicating with their constituents, getting their input, understanding where they are. If you explain to people where we are in terms of a realistic challenge and a problem, and you invite them in so that they have some say, they're gonna help you with the acceptance of the solution, even if it's a little painful. So I believe those are the three things that are important as we approach the 21-23 session. Thank you. What are your major issues and on what committees would you like to serve? So I have four major pieces of legislation that I'd like to push and they reflect the issues I care most about. The first is a civics proficiency requirement for a high school diploma or a GED. The second is something called the Guaranteed Opportunity Program, which would forever change, transform how we leverage debt for post-secondary education and allow career-long access for learning in a way that doesn't cripple people at the beginning of their working lives. The third bill is something called the Western Oregon Regional Carbon Sink. The idea is to basically begin now for recognizing the value we can gain as a state in both longer timber harvest rates, up to 80 years, as well as the sequestration value that we can perhaps get involved into uh, when we get more aligned with the Paris Accord. The fourth thing is creation of a state bank, much like they have in North Dakota. This COVID event, if the Great Recession wasn't enough, but certainly this COVID event has demonstrated the value for farmers and small businesses of a bank that is invested more in public good than a profit. Those are the four bills I hope to, to push forward. Uh, obviously, they go through my, my, my concerns, education and uh, opportunity. Uh, as the chair of the House Vets and Emergency Preparedness Committee, I hope to retain that gavel because I want to continue work on the emergency management reforms we simply must do. That's a committee priority of all of us. And I would like to stay on the Transportation Committee and the Business and Labor Committee, if at all possible. I currently serve on the subcommittee for uh, transportation and economic development. That's a helpful position. Uh, someday I'd like to be able to move to the full ways and means so I can actually have a little more say over both the policy and the funding to make those policies happen. Okay, thank you. And what do you think is the future for forest care after our experience with the fires of 2020 in such areas as thinning, replanting, roads and access for first responders? I think that, that you know, sometimes great disasters have an effect of helping people learn, and sometimes they have an effect of shutting people down and scaring them. I'm hoping it's the first. I'm hoping that it's that we recognize that we've got to learn new forest management practices. Uh, my concern, however, is the way politics operate right now, it'll be the second. It'll be more shutting down and people will go back to their corners and there'll be marginal progress. My hope is to, again, with passage of the Western Oregon Regional Carbon Sink, which would plant a billion trees throughout the state, it would transform the zero sum game we're currently in and provide added flexibility. I'd also like to look at it through the emergency management reform program, a new definition of what safe space and safe defensible space is around structures. One of the tragedies of this particular uh, fire is that for too long we've been too lenient about letting people build houses in places they shouldn't be building houses. The, the wildfires were not the result of just global climate change, though we have to recognize that the global climate shift that's going on is significant and it is fundamentally changing everything. We've also had 20 years of droughts comparatively, which is linked to global climate change. We've also had changes in terms of what uh, clear cutting is allowed, what clear cutting is not. And for a long time, we've been fighting in the courts over how to harvest timber that's been burned or diseased. My hope is that we can come together, put partisanship aside and recognize that our greatest asset moving into the future in addition to our people is our place. And that heart of our place is our forests. So if we can find a way to manage it more effectively, find a way to recognize that nature sometimes must burn things, but at the same time, we can be more clear about where we put people in terms of harm I think we can come up with a with a comprehensive strategy. But I want to be very clear. It's going to be a tough fight because unfortunately, in a zero sum game like we have right now, partisan politics too often get involved. Thank you. 
How will Oregon fund adequate maintenance personnel for forest parks, for state parks, excuse me? So I think, you know, we've just gone through a, a layoff of the parks uh, with the special sessions. We had to make some, some adjustments. Um, I actually have a plan called the Discovery Corps that would take um, people who right now uh, are, uh, they may have a high school diploma, they may not. They're in the neighborhood of age 16 to 25, and they need a purpose. And my goal would be to get back in the business of the old CCC, putting people back into the forest, giving them a, giving them a trade, an apprenticeship program that can get them to a job at the end of the rainbow, and at the same time, uh, get people reinvested in our natural spaces. I believe that we can do both good, healthy forest practices and ensure that our parks are built up and safe and enjoyable if we rethink how we build job training programs in the state of Oregon, especially related to veterans and those that just don't wanna work in an office environment. We have an opportunity and I will continue to fight for the Discovery Corps. I've offered that bill now three sessions. I plan on uh, trying to bring people around it together. Uh, Senator Golden and a number of others uh, are working on that with me to try to find a way to get people who who otherwise might not have a chance, or we have programs, by the way, right now set aside to help those folks and our needs in the wilderness synced up so we can actually benefit from that and have more people, more hands involved in getting our forests into a healthy place. Thank you. So thank, thank you. you, Paul Evans, for our interview today and for sharing your thoughts. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. And again, I, have, I ask everybody to compare the candidates, and I certainly hope I earn the opportunity to get your vote. Thanks to Capital Community Media for their time and expertise in creating this program and making it available across the state through YouTube and Vote 411. Thank you to the several League of Women Voters leagues for being interviewers and suggesting questions. And thanks to you, the public, for watching Your Vote Counts to become a more informed voter. For more voter information, including dates, registration information, candidates for state and local offices, and ballot measure information, please go online to vote411.org. You have until October 13th to register to vote. Ballots will be mailed beginning October 14th. November 3rd is election day. Please remember that postmarks don't count. Elections matter and make a difference. So remember to vote because your vote counts.